Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is our 95th video cast, 85th podcast for the week ending August 13th, 2021. And we'll kick it off with our media and then get right down to it on a nice sun, summer Friday. Uh, we'll try to get to the point and cover the important topics because there are quite a few things we, we want to get to today. Um, first off, I would like to thank Delal Pektas and Rochelle Akufo for having me on CGTN Global Business, CGTN America on Monday night. And we talked about the numbers that came out over the weekend and the Chinese economy in general, uh, the trade balance numbers, uh, missed expectations on exports and imports, but the trade balance exports minus imports did beat estimates at 56 billion. 0.5 billion versus 51.5. Um, they also, some of their numbers were impacted. They had a once in a thousand year flood in the Henan province, which is highly populated, about 100 million people. Uh, and as far as the exports go, part of the miss, obviously slowing medical demand. They don't have the same year-on-year um, -year demand for medical equipment, masks, etc. Or, or the home electronics, so that that uh, hurt their exports a little bit there. Their inflation numbers were higher than expectation, both on the CPI and the PPI, and um, foreign reserves, which is um, you know gold, treasury bills, government bonds, corporate bonds, uh, measures foreign assets held or controlled by the uh, country's central bank. They were larger than expected at 3.2 trillion. 3.23 trillion versus 3.21 trillion. Um, the key story in China right now is Delta. Uh, on Sunday, they had 125 new confirmed inf infections, up from 96. And they have a zero COVID strategy. So unlike the West, where you kind of put your mask on, you be careful, um, you get vaccinated and you go about your business, uh, if they get like one case, they shut down a whole city. And that's really weighing on small businesses and consumer sentiment. Um, and, and that's why relative to the Western world, their consumer has not recovered to the same extent for two reasons. First off, their stimulus was focused on infrastructure and construction over direct payments like we saw in the U.S. That's going to serve them well in the long term because they're going to get a return on that investment. Uh, but two, these sporadic uh, shutdowns when new COVID cases pop up, they really create a lot of fear and uncertainty for the employees and small businesses because they don't know if they're going to have a job next week or if their factory is going to be open. Uh, and, uh, and these actions incentivize saving versus spending, despite the fact that they have a large percent now uh, pot of their population vaccinated. They don't have the mRNA vac vaccines. They have... Uh, Sinovac, which is about as uh, helpful as the flu vaccine. It's kind of a coin flip uh, in terms of its efficacy. So um, uh, that that's something that they're going to have to work through. On the air travel, they had their biggest drop since the start of COVID. 32% uh, less seats were offered uh, week on week. Uh, and many places have, have gradually locked down and mass testing has been administered. administered. Uh, they've also canceled some large scale exhibitions uh, in August and uh, travel restrictions and flight cancellations and warnings about taxi and other type of transportation. So as a result of this, uh, we're seeing that, um, uh, well, first off, their GDP missed for Q2. It was 7.9% versus 8.1% expected. Goldman Sachs cut their growth forecast uh, on on the Delta variant this week, uh, actually on Monday morning, and but they're looking through it. So they're basically saying they expect the third quarter to come in at plus 2.3%, down from plus 5.8%. But they lifted the fourth quarter to 8.5% from 5.8%. So their whole year is anticipated to come in at plus 8.3 versus uh, 8.6, which is well above the government's target of 6.0. And uh, so that's the bad news. The good news is, is that the government has re responded accordingly. Uh, a number of weeks ago, they reduced the reserve requirement for banks. This actually freed up 
$154 billion uh, to be lent to small businesses. And they intimated this week that uh, more stimulus is on the way. They're going to invest more and do more infrastructure spending. The Politburo made that assertion. Uh, and I think that with their zero COVID strategy uh, and what we've seen in the UK and in India, where the spikes lasted 45 to 50 days, uh, I do think they're going to get it under control probably quicker than expected. And um, uh, some of these estimates are a little bit conservative. So, uh, But that said, uh, what did well during these type of shutdowns were the online tech companies, as we saw both here and in China last year. So um, that, that's something to keep keep in mind. So, so that was based, the basis of the segment with Rochelle. Thanks again for having me on. I um, want to thank Ellie Terrett and Charlie Gasparino for including me in their article on the regulation of Bitcoin. Um, all these different agencies are fighting for control over it from the CFPB to the CFTC and to the SEC. And my basic uh, point was that they may have to wind up creating a new category for it over time. Right now, it doesn't fit any any category perfectly, but I think the CFTC has the mo most cogent argument at present because it's not a currency because if you have to sell it, if, if you buy some, if you sell it to buy something, you have to pay taxes, which you don't have to with the currency. So uh, it doesn't qualify under there. As far as the security, if they do have an ETF, that would give the SEC more uh, authority over it, but they haven't done that yet. So really, you know, store of value commodities is store of value if if you're of that camp i mean i guess the real question would be how did they classify tulips in the 17th century uh would be a better way to look at it but um nonetheless where we are where we are so thanks for including in, me in that uh then we got the segments up from last week i was on the cbc radio with uh megan reed uh, so you can check that out those were regarding robin hood there are two small segments there Want to thank Devik Jane and Amber Warwick for having me in Reuters twice this week. Uh, the first one was on Monday, where I said the overriding trepidation is still coming from the Delta variant, and the market is just being a little cautious here despite the strong jobs report. That was on Monday morning. The Fed is uh, probably looking forward to Jackson Hole, to whether or not uh, the Fed is going to change their tune and possibly talk about taper earlier than later. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. And then uh, yesterday, you know, the market was basically doing nothing again. Uh, this is summer doldrums at its finest, and there's not a whole lot to do unless there's a major headline. We're kind of seeing the market just muddle along here. Uh, so that was the sentiment yesterday. And in the context of inflation, which we're going to talk a little bit about this week, I pulled up this Buffett quote, which I, I thought was really useful. And what he said was, it makes no difference to a widow with her savings in a 5% passbook account whether she pays 100% income tax on her interest income during a period of zero inflation or pays no income tax during the years of 5% inflation. Either way, she is taxed in a manner that leaves her no real income whatsoever. Any money she spends comes right out of capital. She would find it outrageous 100% income tax, but doesn't seem to notice that 5% inflation is the economic equivalent. And these are some questions that we're going to grapple with on a go forward basis. I don't think we're headed to 5% uh, inflation, although we did get year on year CPI numbers over 5%. But uh, whether that will persist or not, we're going to kind of uh, go into a little bit on this call. The other quote that came to mind, uh, given you know um, uh, some different things that we're going to discuss. Charlie Munger he says it's waiting that helps you as an investor, and a lot of people just can't stand to wait. And uh, you know we we went through that with uh, Wells Fargo last year, which is now over fifty, by the way, uh, and um, and we're going through it with uh, Alibaba, and we're going to go through some some good stuff on Alibaba this week. I'm excited to share with you. Um, and we went through it with Pfizer, by the way, which has just started to rocket the, uh, in the last few weeks, which we'll, we'll, which we'll cover that. The other quote that really stood, stood out for me this week was uh, another Buffett quote. Most people get interested in stocks whenever everyone else is. The time to get interested is when no one else is. You can't buy what is popular and do well. 
That's the most important thing. You can't buy what is popular and do well. And right now there are a lot of things that are popular, but there are a number of things that aren't. And those are what we've historically focused on and that's how we've done our knitting and it's paid, paid well for us. So we're gonna focus in on that. Um, wanna take a couple questions of the week. Uh, Mark Messer from Florida said, hey Tom, just be done with it and move to Florida. I guess he's referring to the uh, uh, Tampa pictures from last week. We're back up in Connecticut this week. Uh, we'd love to have you here. Um, what do you say? Follow up on a question from last week regarding Cigna options. You mentioned the time frame, uh, but what strike price do you choose for a long call? In the money, at the money, or out of the money? On those, we did deep in the money and we added to those this week. So um, so timely question. We love the Cigna story. I think it can go back and retest those lows. So you may get another bite at the Apple next week, but I think by the end of the uh, the year that that uh, that stock's gonna work its way up back up to new highs. Uh, so great question there. And speaking of which, um, Splunk, if you remember, uh, we're going through this right now in Cigna where, you know, you have a sell-off after earnings. And if you remember on our podcast video cast that week, um, when it just got slammed after earnings, we said we were adding, uh, weren't happy about it. Well, now it's, it's really started to take off. It's up 33% and it looks like about eight weeks here since that puke on earnings and, uh, got an upgrade this week from UBS after it's up 30% where, uh, analyst Carl Kierstead upgraded Splunk to buy from neutral with a price target of $175 up from $137. So I think this has room to run and it's nice to see that everyone sees what we saw months ago and we shared here on the podcast. So exciting for that. Uh, Ed Yardeni was out, is out in Barron's this weekend. Um, he's basically making the bull case for S&P 5000 over the next 12 months. And his base case is the earnings are going to move up to $230 a share, which is what we've been saying on this podcast for six or eight weeks. And um, on that basis, he also thinks the multiple is going to stay elevated at 22 times. And that's how he gets to 50, 60. Um, I'm less bullish on the multiple. I'm more bullish on earnings. I think earnings can push higher than 230. I think the multiple is going to contract a little bit as the taper begins and um, uh, so, so that's where I'm at on it. But either way, I think you, you get there. I do think that next year, um, and I know that at the beginning of the year when we talked about uh, having a handful of contained pullbacks like 2017 and 2013, people were skeptical, but that so far is what has happened. Uh, we've been having these uh, tiny 3% pullbacks and now um now we are um moving through i do think that's going to change next year i think we'll finally get like in 2010 and 2011 early in the new business cycle we'll get a nice 10 to 20 percent correction uh and my guess best guess is that'll come sometime after february uh when when taper begins so uh it might not be a straight line to this 50 60 12 years out, uh, 12 months, uh, you know, 12 to 16 months out that he's calling for, but I like the general direction. It's just not going to be a straight line. Uh, Boeing Max takes to China skies and test to end flight ban. This will be a huge catalyst for Boeing. We own Boeing. We've talked about Boeing and we think that's going to continue to work higher. So it's nice to see some progress there. It also shows some progress with China, uh, which, um, uh, we're going to spend some time on in this call. The other thing that it was nice to see this week is, um, if you remember, in February and March, we were talking utilities. They shot right up. They pulled back. We said we think they're going to have a second leg. They're starting to have that second leg in a material way. There's uh, Nextera. Here's Dominion starting to move up. Uh, we like this one longer term. It's going to keep pushing up. And Dominion was a, a key. And here's Con Edison. Um, where is American Electric Power? Uh, here it is. Oh gosh, how uh, I can't get it over. Let me see if I can do it this way. There we go. Okay, so here was February, March, shot up, pulled back, and here's the second leg starting. Looks like that's going to break out and follow through as well. So that's good to see. Pfizer, new development on Pfizer. Um, 
So the stock's up now 49% in uh, five and a half months. We took profits this week and uh, we did that not because we don't think it's going to push higher to $50 or beyond over time, um, but because we think there are better uses of the capital now. And I think two things are going to happen. We are on day 40, about 44. Four or 45 uh, of this Delta spike. And if you recall, I said that uh, both India and the UK peaked around uh, day 45 and day 50. And if we get a peak in cases in the next week to two weeks, I do think that Pfizer is going to roll over in the short term. Now, we may use that to buy Pfizer stock in the long term, but in the meantime, we wanted to take profits because we had a lot of option exposure and they're up multiples. And uh, this has just been a monster move, you know, 49% in a handful of weeks since the end of February, uh, early March when we put it out. So uh, we love this story, uh, but it was time to ring the register and uh, we hope to get the chance to reload, but it'll have to be from lower levels. If this pushes into the 50s without us, no regrets. It was a great trade and um, very unpopular one when we put it out. And many people were really struggling with themselves waiting through this. Uh, but that's why I remind you guys, it's the waiting and gals that helps you as an investor. And a lot of people just can't stand to wait. Also, by the way, I wanna acknowledge Kristen Myers of Yahoo Finance. I saw today is her last day at Yahoo Finance. I always enjoyed going on uh, Yahoo with her and I was lucky enough to be on with her last week we covered it on the video cast last week so wishing her a great new chapter wherever she's headed um, and just thought I'd uh, put that out there uh, next big move in the 10-year yield this week it seems to have cooled a little bit we'll continue to watch this obviously the the push higher in banks was attributable to this um, and let's see, because it's kind of interesting to see utilities getting a bid and banks getting a bid in the same week. Um, so, so let's just continue to watch this. The yield curve is still steep. Goldman put this out this week. Goldman estimates that 77% of the U.S. population has COVID immunity. That's another reason why, um, you know, there was just, I saw this enormous block of um, Pfizer calls that came in at, when, after it went parabolic uh, on Tuesday, and that's when I decided to, to ring the register, it just got a little too giddy, a little too late. Like you're kind of at peak hysteria about Delta and you're kind of at peak euphoria about the vaccine companies. And with Moderna, you know, rolling over some 30% or so, um, I just think that everyone knows boosters are in the picture. Uh, now we got to focus on Pfizer's real business, which is up 10% year on year. The pipeline's so-so. Uh, so again, it, it'd have to drop lower, and I think it may for me to reload for the long term, which I may be inclined to do. But there was a better use of that money, and uh, you may or may not be surprised where it went, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, here's the article of the week, which is the deja vu stock market and sentiment results. This is two quotes from Yogi Berra. It feels like deja vu all over again to describe one aspect of the current market climate. This is in contrast to what many talking heads are saying about China in recent days, uh, which is the future ain't what it used to be. So this is the push pull. Is it deja vu all over again in China or is it the future ain't what it used to be? Uh, and I drew this out because not many people are talking about it, but the same thing happened in, two, in October of 2018, actually March through October 2018. China cracked down on its online gaming providers by stopping approval of any new games. It basically shut it down like it, it's shutting down um, education providers. And in a similar fashion uh, to uh, it, 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 what's happening with the online education providers, all of Chinese stocks were punished in response to the arbitrary crackdown and regulation in 2018. And it's the same thing here in 2020. So I put a bunch of articles up in this uh, note of the week 
Um, one was from The Economist. You can see the date here, November 10th, 2018. China's gaming crackdown should worry the entire industry. And gaming firms... Uh, skill at extracting money from players risks a regulatory backlash. Now, uh, <laughs> two things that were interesting because they've said the same thing about uh, the education providers. The danger that poses to children in particular have more substance to them and are already prompting a regulatory crackdown. Then uh, the, the government clamped down on the approval of new games earlier this year. That was around March. So the stock's you know, sold down from March to October, stopped approvals altogether in October. So it was sell the, the news was getting bad. The news got as bad as it could get in October. And you're going to see what happened after that. Uh, shares in 10 cent are down 28%, but they actually were peak to trough from, from the October down was 49.29% in about, uh, uh, so from March through October, um, call that six, six, seven months. And what was interesting about this 2018 article in The Economist, November 10th, was they said, China is an authoritarian state prone to overreaction. So this happens on a regular cyclical basis. They basically, you know, these companies get a little loosey-goosey. The Chinese government has to bring them in. They overshoot. They overshoot with letting them run wild, and then they overshoot with the sh with the regulation, and then they realize, oh my God, these companies employ hundreds of thousands of people and pay great jobs. We can't destroy them. Number one, number two, if we want to be a global player, we don't want to regulate them to death because we'll wind up like Europe, who has no no major tech players because their regulatory environment is horrible and it impedes innovation. So um, so then they reverse course, and we're starting to see that. And when did they reverse course was when they went overboard and said no new games and then abruptly switched. And you saw this kind of um, final capitulatory puke out. And that was the beginning of a, it rallied 62.5% over the next six months. And then over the next two years, it rallied 216% after the assertion that they would never approve another game as long as they lived. And sure enough, after this capitulation, everyone blinked and flipped because it was in their interest, not because they're weak or anything, because they want to be strong and they realize, wait, we're killing ourselves. And sure enough, people do what's in their interest. The same, We're at the same space here. They peaked in uh, March and uh, and now they're down forty about 45%. We may have had that similar capitulatory uh, bottom and now we're retesting that same thing that we saw in October. So it's something worth keeping an eye on. Here's another uh, Wall Street Journal oct article in October of 2018 after a 50% correction in NetEase uh, anticipating quote the worst was yet to come. It marked the beginning of a 288% rally. Uh, China's pause on video game approvals expected to drag into next year. This was October 24th, 2018. And uh, here is October 24th. That was actually the exact bottom of the stock. And it subsequently rallied 288% over the next two years. And then this article from also from October 2018 on Business Indi in Indicator indicated that there were, quote, few signs that China is willing to expedite the approval process and that some Chinese officials believe the increased popularity of video games has had a negative impact on children. Um, so you can read through that. And then here was a headline that dropped on Reuters. This would not be uh, comfort inspiring for investors at that time. 10 cents profit drops for the first time in nearly 13 years. And you can see what was going on with 10 cent stock. If you're owning it or buying it, it's down. Let's uh, when that headline dropped, it was probably down about 45%. It ultimately bottomed at 50% down. And um, you're like, wow, they're you know their profits are down first time in 13 years. Maybe it's the beginning of the end. It was the beginning of the beginning, and um, and that's just the way sentiment works. And that's why these type of things are so important to keep in mind. It's the waiting that helps you in, as an investor. A lot of people just can't stand to wait. 
And, um, and that's just, you know, it's the, look, I said it last week. Why doesn't everyone do this? If you buy quality merchandise when it's on sale, why doesn't everyone do that and get rich also? And the answer is, is because it's hard to do because at the time when it makes sense to buy, it's like at, at the time it makes sense to buy is the exact time when everyone's saying, this is not a good time to buy and the headlines are pounding and everyone all the managers are puking out of it you you know there are a number of high profile managers that were puking out in the last week uh you can look them up and um and and that's you know and that's when things turn at the peak of these these acute stages you just got to hold on sometimes it's a few days sometimes it's a few weeks sometimes it's a couple of months and that's just the you know that's just what it is but if you want these 288% and 150% uh type rallies where you build real wealth you got to go through the pain otherwise everyone would do it and it wouldn't exist and the markets would be per perfectly efficient and um you know that, that that that's that's um that anyway so this is what we focus on um okay and also in october it's 2018 uh, it looked like the end of the line for big tech in China. Even Alibaba was crushed in sympathy with the regulatory crackdown on video gamers and capital was fleeing out of an unfriendly regulatory regime. People didn't like the arbitrary regulation and crackdowns that came out of the blue and knocked 50% off their biggest best stocks uh, and money just fleed because they didn't want to hold it on its books and they didn't have the type of investment partners that understood and could take a longer term view to get the to get the huge benefits and and deal with the short term volatility um uh to get this so so the blue vertical line marks the october november 2018 period here um so you had this capitulation then you had a back a retest and then um so baba cr crashed 40 percent in four months it went on to rally 150 percent over the next two years and you got a monster short-term rally from uh, 130 to 195, so give or take 50 plus percent in you know a matter of months after you got that capitulatory bottom and retest. Um, and I, I think you know we could wind up seeing something similar in this type of situation. I don't think we make new highs in in the next handful of months, but I do think we could get a wicked uh, rebound rally uh, relatively quickly. Now. The other pattern worth noting, so so here's here's the, the story, down 40%, up 50% basically overnight, and then up 150% over the next couple of years. Down 45% here, we had that capitulation low at 179. You know, maybe we retest, maybe we don't. Uh, we use the profits from Pfizer to add to uh, BABA again uh, today. And um, so, you know, I think it's just uh, an attractive situation whether we get this rip your face off rally uh, immediately or if it takes another couple months, it, it makes no difference. But I, I think sentiment has really gone beyond the point of um, excess. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, I'm going to just switch gears here, is on uh, yesterday. So you saw a little weakness yesterday and today. China unveils the five-year plan to strengthen control of the, the economy. This is from the Financial Times. Uh, Communist Party seeks to extend oversight of important sectors in, the last, in its latest step of regulatory assault. That's the bad news. The good news is, what this headline should say is, China government finally tells you what they're going to do and the extent of the pain they're going to inflict on the tech industry. And they've given some clear um directives of what they're going to be focused on and i i think what what this is is basically this is the news so the rumor is all this bad stuff is coming the news is here's what we're going to do and here are the regulatory in, 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 interventions and controls that we're going to have so i think that drop of their five-year plan yesterday was kind of like the capitulatory bottom I think now what you're just seeing, the more bad news that comes, it's kind of like Boeing stock was, you know, eventually it just, you got so much bad news, the stock just started to go up on bad news because it's like it had already priced in the end of the world. And I think the same thing is true when you're talking about these kind of oligopolies, uh, tech oligopolies in China, 
which we have in the States with, you know, our FANG, uh, they have with their, I don't know what their acronym is, but, you know, Alibaba, Tencent, JD, um, you know, Baidu, etc. I think that uh, so much bad news has come out, they, they just kind of stop going down on really bad news. And that's usually when you get the turns and then you get the rip your face off rallies because there's just no more bad news and all the sellers and all the weak hands are out. Um, now, the other thing I noticed, and the only reason I'm doing this um, charting uh, uh, visual stuff for you guys is because we've covered the fundamental uh, case ad infinitum. So now we want to look at possible pivot points. And from 2014 through 2017, the IPO, uh, Baba went down and then back up, forming what they call a cup-shaped pattern. So that's this red line here. And then uh, it broke out to new highs in mid-2017. So it broke out of this cup, and then it rallied up, and, um, and then it rolled over to back to around where the point where it broke out so it um did this cup it broke out and then it rolled out back to this support right here okay so kind of like a long extended breakout and back test and then it ripped higher from 129 to 319 after touching that breakout point uh, we have the similar pattern happening right here um it, uh, it basically then, uh, you know, rolled over to this breakout point and then finally broke out again in late 2019, creating another cup right here with this red line, rallied all the way up, and now it's come back exactly to where this breakout point. And you can see it. There's all this institutional volume here that has done a good job so far defending these levels, this breakout point, And what did you get? Again, you got this monster 50% rally in like literally two months um, after the bad news in 2018. Now, you can't say this is going to do it all the time and coincidence, but it's worth noting. And these type of patterns tend to repeat. It doesn't mean they will. History doesn't repeat it. It rhymes. But I think the sentiment, the fundamental, um, you know, all this liquidity, there's not a lot of places left to go where you can find value. We bought a few airlines this week, not you know, nothing huge. We bought a little bit of cruise line this week, nothing huge. But we we added to Baba because literally for my money, there's no better place I can go. Understanding the risk, quantifying the risk with with options, um, uh, and just looking at where we are in terms of sentiment. You know, you have this kind of capitulatory shakeout and then a rollover you had a similar situation here so we'll see how that plays um but i i like that they're defending this this volume pocket here and i like that they're defending the breakout level so let's see how it plays out um and then now the okay so here's what i said now now that we've uh retested the 2019 breakout point and bounced we'll see if we can get a new strong rally in coming months uh, break out to new highs in the next year or so the fundamentals support $300 of intrinsic value in the short to intermediate term and if the Chinese government lets the business perform it's likely to see $400 plus in coming years and become a global tech leader no question about it um, and you know I think we've seen this movie before so here's uh, not 2018 articles but uh, 2021 articles from August 7th Chinese state media call video games quote spiritual opium kids today should play pinball yes pinball and there are pictures of pinball machines uh in this market watch article then the wall street journal this is from uh august 8th so five days ago china attempts to take the stress out of schooling sparks its own angst so beijing's education overall which aims to e ease intense competition turns life upside down for anxious parents as i covered last week um, they, they chop these, um, uh, education providers down to nothing because they think that'll force parents to have, to want to have more babies. And it does exactly the opposite. The last thing a Chinese parent's going to do is have another baby with less access to education. And they wind up working in a factory. They want their kids to go work for Alibaba. So 
the government's going to figure out, let's see, how can we make Alibaba bigger so they can provide more high paying jobs so that parents get more excited about having babies uh, to fill those jobs. And that's the future that parents want. And they're getting a ton of pushback from these parents who want the tutors because it's not about competing in China. Okay, so you kill off all the tutors in China. It just makes China stupider as a country, you know, less intelligent as a country. Um, but they still have to compete globally. So I, I think this is going to find some some uh, healthy middle ground, just like the online gamers when they were never going to approve another game. And then all of a sudden uh, they changed their tune. Why? Because it's in their interest. So um, our bet is we already know how this movie ends. So it's your choice. Is it deja vu all over again? And this is another 2018 and we're going to see a rip your face off rally. Or is it the future ain't what it used to be, like the majority of the talking heads are saying uh, uh, in the last handful of days and weeks? Uh, we're in the former cat camp, and we believe that Yogi would be too. Uh, so then we covered the uh, CGTN and the Yahoo last week. Um, oh, speaking of which, uh, there was another question last week. Ben Be Healthy asked, uh, this, but I was already recording when he asked it. He said, is XLF bounce today a head fake? You know, we, we had already answered that question. Uh, we said that the only bank we would put brand new money into at those levels was City, which we covered on Yahoo last week. So I hope you heard that City was up this week. Um, and then does SMH have more gas in the tank? That's semiconductors. I've already answered that question. I think he asked it two weeks ago. I said I had no view on the semiconductor business at all, other than the fact that we like Intel. And we covered Intel on Friday on Yahoo. And you can review the notes here. Um, we covered the health of the consumer last week that was related to, um, uh, the Yahoo appearance. We covered the sideways market in the, uh, Russell and in the Dow correcting sideways. The Dow broke out this week. So that's good to see. And then inflation is something I want to cover a little bit this week. Um, I did a segment for CGTN today. I'll try to get that link out over the weekend and, the basis was, um, you know, what's driving the price hike in everyday items. And I said that, you know, we can't ignore the amount of spending and monetary liquidity that's been injected to the system in just over a year uh, because of COVID. As of March 15th, we are at $5.3 trillion in COVID spend, spending programs, direct payments to individuals, and that excludes the $1.2 trillion of infrastructure package that was just approved by the Senate. And it also excludes the $3.5 trillion uh, Green New Deal and spending package that's going to get jammed through with reconciliation before the end of the year. Although Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia uh, may put a wrinkle in that because um, he's saying that we're getting to be uh, irresponsible. And I know that um, Stanley Druckenmiller was down in D.C., visiting many of these senators saying this is absolutely crazy you're throwing fire into a fire the economy's already recovered you're you know this is how i would destroy an economy if i was trying to destroy a foreign country you got to stop and maybe mansion heard you should listen to this uh interview that uh drucken miller did with stephanie rule on msnbc uh definitely worthwhile now um so you've had this 5.3 plus 3.5 is coming plus 1.2, that's 10. Then you've added another $4 trillion to the Fed balance sheet. You know, $14 trillion on a $22 trillion economy. After we've recovered, it's getting to be out of control. So how have we been able to hold inflation at bay um, and uh, over the last 20 years? And that's, the answer is twofold. Um, one is the decline in the velocity of money. So that's this chart here. As you can see, that velocity has cratered. So here's the Fed balance sheet, here's the spending, and here's the velocity of money. Since the turn of the century, it's fallen off a cliff. Why is that? Because the peak spending of the baby boomers uh, was at the turn of the century. If you remember, they were doing housing formation and family formation in the early 80s that created a 20-year bull. Okay. So that's the good news. So we've been able to have all this monetary stimulus and not get uh, inflation. Great. Um, the second reason is the, that we haven't had inflation is because, or major runaway inflation, 
is because most policy stimulus over the past two decades was monetary versus fiscal. We had a lot of congressional gridlock and monetary stimulus winds up in asset prices and fiscal stimulus winds up in people's pockets. And usually it's often in the pockets of those who are inclined to spend the whole dollar and spend most of it recirculated back in the economy. So we haven't had much fiscal stimulus here. We've had monetary policy, which has helped with asset inflation, but, uh, but tempered real inflation. And I think the, the two factors, these two factors are changing abruptly right now. So first off, the boomer spending that rolled off is now being displaced by our largest demographic of the population. Boomers were 70 million, millennials are 72 million, their median age is around 30 years old. They're starting their peak spending cycle just like the boomers were back here uh, of housing and family formation, that's number one. Number two, while monetary policy is still running hot, fiscal stimulus is higher than ever. More direct payments and spending projects are being injected into the economy that at any point in history and that may very well create a scenario that with too many dollars chasing too few goods and an inability to be offset by another factor, a deflationary factor, which was technological innovation. So there, may, there will be a significant amount of technological in innovation. The question is whether it's enough to exceed the pickup in velocity that I think is going to come over the next five and 10 years. Um, Obviously, the gainers of inflation are debtors. So if you take out a 30-year fixed mortgage at near 5,000-year low rates this year, um, um, you will benefit because you will be paying back that fixed obligation with inflated dollars or dollars that are worth less at some point in the future. Uh, and by the way, um, you know, people complain about housing prices. If you compare it to 2006, or 2007, the cost of ownership, when you look at rate, the 30 year fix, I think was six and change. Um, and, um, and now it's, you know, half that and prices haven't doubled in most areas. So uh, affordability is, is better and all that other stuff, but, uh, and the consumer is better, et cetera. Now, um, governments are big beneficiaries. And this has been the formula of every government since the dawn of history. They just inflate their debts away and debt to GDP goes goes down as a function of nominal GDP increasing through inflation. That's the plan. No government has ever repaid its debt ever in the history of the world. Uh, so uh, they just keep rolling it and inflating their way out of it. And that continues until it doesn't. And then some actually default. Uh, and um, and that's that's just the cycle of history. And then owners of assets, real estate assets, land, uh, commodities, and ownership of high quality companies that have a moat and pricing power to pass on increased costs to consumers and maintain margins. And um, and we, we cover a lot of them on this uh, podcast video cast. Now, who gets hurt the most? Creditors, you know, people lending out money at today's rates are gonna get paid back with uh, dollars that are worth a lot less. Um, consumer, usually the price of food, gas, shelter, etc., are going to rise faster and sooner than wages. Uh, between 1940 and 1982, the value of a dollar fell from $700 to $100 or 85% in purchasing power. Um, so you can see that here, 1940, 700 to 1980, 100. Um, and then savers, and Warren Buffett addressed that, you know, the money served will lose purchasing power at an accelerated rate if not invested in the right assets. Again, if you've got, you know, 5% interest rate on your savings and uh, you got 5% inflation, it's like 100% tax um, or 3% and 3%. So that's that. Um, the number we're keeping an eye on moving forward is wages. Wages are sticky. That'll tell the whole story. We saw in the jobs report that um, wages were up 4% year on year versus 3.8% estimated. The Fed's betting that when kids go back to school and uh, benefits roll off, that a whole new supply of labor is going to return to keep wages down. We're going to see how that thesis plays out or if it plays out. And then there'll be some Delta noise maybe in the short term. 
Uh, consumer prices, 12 months, uh, CPI increased 5.4% year on year. So that's not a great thing. Um, it was a bit moderated in uh, July over June. July was up uh, 5 tenths of a percent versus 9 tenths of a percent in June. So that's a good trend. Energy and food are the biggest contributors. And finally, we saw used cars finally drop from up 10.5% in June to up two tenths of a percent in July. So that's going to help the numbers moving forward. The producer price index, though, uh, was uh, high. You know, it was 7.8% uh, year on year versus 7.3. This is the largest advance since 12 months of data uh, were first calculated in November of 2010. So got to keep your eyes on that. Some of it's due to supply bottlenecks. Some of it's due to uh, transportation. Uh, freight costs, I think I heard that uh, to send one of those 40-foot things from China to here, it used to be a year ago, it was like 2,000 bucks. Now it's uh, 10 or 20,000. So some of those will work out, but some of them, you know, particularly wages, once you see those going up, and that's why Powell made the concession transitory is not like lumber where it spikes and rolls over. It's It means that he expects the rate of change to slow. So rather than going up 5.4% year on year, um, they'll not go up as fast. Maybe they'll go up 2%, but they're not going back down. So, you know, they're, you, you, you know $14 trillion of all-in stimulus it, on a $22 trillion economy you know, if velocity kicks in, that's the real worry. Now, that's the bad news. Uh, but they're the tools to deal with it. It's just a question of how how quickly they'll have to raise rates. And I think that there will be enough deflationary and transitory effects to keep it slow enough. But I do think inflation will be above trend, you know, maybe north of 3% for, for a few years, which they've quasi signaled that they're okay with. The lady who interviewed me for uh, April for CGTN, today said well how do you how do you hedge against that and that was a great question and the only way that to hedge against inflation is to invest in yourself so um whether we wind up trading in seashells or dollars that you know it, it you know a mcdonald's lunch costs 30 dollars instead of 10 dollars uh the name of the game is if you're good at whatever you do and in the case of april i said if you're a great journalist or you're a great broadcaster and you continually learn and develop you're going to command more of the currency regardless of what it's worth or what it's traded in whether it's traded in uh, bitcoins or tulips or dollars that are worth less or worth more or digital dollars it doesn't matter you're going to control a larger share when you invest in yourself and figure out how to deliver more value to the marketplace um, so i'd worry less about inflation and i'd worry more about increasing your value to the marketplace and that's a hedge against everything and that would be the best advice that i would give to uh any any people listening don't fear inflation it, it also creates a tremendous amount of opportunities um in in certain asset classes so you just we'll just take it as it comes week by week we'll look at the data and we'll adjust accordingly uh the sentiment surveys came in this week um still a little bit bullish but uh 37% bullish on the uh, retail, 31% bearish. So there is some fear. The fear and greed index was at 39. That's still bearish. So there's still a little bit of a wall of worry here. We'll keep an eye on that. Uh, and the, let's see where the National Association of Active Investment Managers are, because this prints after the article. Um, give me a second here. N A A I M. Okay, so that came in at 97.55. Okay, so it didn't change much. Um, the other thing that people have been complaining about is market breadth. You know, too few stocks are pushing the indices higher while the Russell and the Dow uh, grind sideways. The, the Dow did break out this week, so that was good news. Um, Urban Carmel, he's a commentator on Twitter. I, I don't think he manages any money, but he puts out some really good charts. Um, he put this out in February and he basically showed how declining breath was not always indicative um, of a top. And this was kind of the most recent data that I put out where you could see that this S&P stocks above their 50-day 
moving average started to climb so that breadth is actually improving um, but you know whether we get a correction or not um, is less important than buying quality when it's on sale I mean some of these stocks are so beaten up that you know uh, they'd probably rally on a, a general indices correction and that's where we're looking is to find that value and to get ahead of those rotations um, as we covered last week there's still more areas there are more areas still on sale than not you just have to know where to look and buy what's marked down and we went through the different groups through the bullish percent um, and that there's plenty of selective opportunity but you can go back through these and you saw how you know the market was hitting the indices were hitting new highs but many of these in uh, these sectors and groups were just starting to turn back the other way so um, there is opportunity that's the news is there Morningstar I like how they their analysts uh, think about stocks they're very Buffett-esque they're always at the Buffett meetings and uh, this article went out this week four very undervalued wide moat China stocks basically saying we think that uh, this is this is starting to get overdone and um, they talk about they do this kind of price to fair value whether the business has a moat or not and they're saying that uh, Alibaba is trading at two-thirds of its intrinsic value which is exactly in line with what we've been saying we think it's got an immediate intrinsic value of three hundred dollars longer term it can go to four hundred and beyond if the government just gets out of the way same with uh, Tencent Yum China and they also listed Baidu so um, so we like these over the intermediate to long term uh, also this week you did have a couple analysts turn a few days ago China tech stocks rise as analysts turn positive after the sell-off um, Bernstein and company came out saying that uh, there was so much bad news on tech companies early this month so it's not a surprise that some investors bought s such stocks after the slump uh, oh, that was just a quote let's see the internet sector as a whole uh, da, 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 da. regulatory environment stabilizes uh, Bernstein upgraded the stock market the Chinese stock market to, to market perform on Tuesday followed the CICC slightly bullish note from Monday in which analysts including Yan Yan Zhao said that the share price contraction has fully reflected the negatives and there should be further upside for video content penetration he's talking about big tech um, so you know you'll start to get more of these and and opinion follows trend that's been the name of the game since we started this we've constantly pounded that opinion follows trend the higher the price rebounds the more analysts that will jump on board and start to upgrade it which will give uh, uh, institutional managers cover to start to put money at work because Bernstein said it's okay because JP Morgan and by the way I wouldn't be surprised if JP Morgan starts upgrading China why would I say that because they just got approved for a securities license uh, JP Morgan wins permission for full control of a securities business in China Wall Street get, giant gets more market access can offer a full range of investment in corporate banking security services and asset management uh, China that's showing positive signs from the Chinese government it's also showing that the number one operator in the business Jamie Dimon believes that it's going to be a stable environment to make a huge investment and to plan for decades to come that was a nice development to see and um, that was that just some unusual auctions activity Intel 6,000 contracts that, uh, that was what month was that that was for uh, June of next year nice to see that Kimberly Clark today 2,000 contracts some of these staples are starting to get bid now get that second leg Delta Airlines insider buying 28,000 shares this week um, estimates came up a little bit now they're up to 218.60 for 2022 on the S&P and then the economic data more jobs available uh, 10 million jobs available so that's good to see still a short-term mismatch probably an issue with child care which hopefully gets re resolved in September um, we went over the CPI and the PPI numbers uh, crude inventories a modest draw this week 325,000 barrels um, continuing claims was better than expected so that's uh, the most important number that's good to see initial jobless claims met expectations that was good to see uh, consumer 
Michigan King Consumer Expectations. God bless you that don't have the TV turned on all day. I got to say, the media has done an incredible job of covering Delta. I mean, it's like literally every 10 minutes, you know, get your vaccine or you're going to die. So it's understandable that they've destroyed consumer sentiment in the short term. That will flip just as fast when the cases peak and roll over. Hopefully it's in that, you know, 45, 50, 55 day range like we saw in India and China, uh, in India and the UK. And then this, this sentiment should come right back, but uh, worth keeping an eye on in, in the short term. So with that said, we're going to wrap up here. Wishing everyone a great weekend. Until next week, make it a great one. Thanks for listening in.